happened to go to Transylvania and, and do this land transaction for Count Dracula. And he writes memos along the way, memos about a meal he ate, memos about something happened in the castle. Bram was doing the same thing in this notebook. We see all these little entries, M-E-M, mem, you know, this, and, and a thought to follow. And so there is, I think there's a, that there is a lot of Bram Stoker within Jonathan Harker. And Bram Stoker's Lost Journal will be published next year. Now on BBC Radio Ulster, a ten-part series to celebrate Halloween. Actor Michael Fassbender reads the classic tale of the world's most famous vampire, Dracula, by Bram Stoker. The story begins as Jonathan Harker arrives in Transylvania to visit the Count. Jonathan Harker, May the 3rd, Bistritz, left Munich at 8.35 p.m., arriving at Vienna early next morning. Budapest seems a wonderful place, from the glimpse which I got of it from the train and the little I could walk through the streets. Having had some time at my disposal in London, I had visited the British Museum and made search among the books and maps in the library regarding Transylvania. It had struck me that some foreknowledge could hardly fail to have some importance in dealing with the noblemen of that country. I shall enter here some of my notes, as they may refresh my memory when I talk over my travels with Mina. I find that the district he named is in the east of the country, in the midst of the Carpathian Mountains, one of the wildest and least known portions of Europe. I was not able to light on any map, or work giving the exact locality of the Castle Dracula, as there are no maps of this country as yet to compare with our own Ordnance Survey maps. But I found that Bistritz, the post town named by Count Dracula, is a fairly well-known place. It was on the dark side of twilight when we got to Bistritz. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Crone Hotel. I was evidently expected, for when I got near the door, an elderly woman in peasant dress bowed and said, The Herr Englishman. She gave some message to an elderly man. He immediately returned with a letter. My friend, welcome to the Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. At three tomorrow the diligence will start for Bukovina. At the Borgo Pass, my carriage will await you. Your friend, Dracula. Fourth of May. I found that my landlord had got a letter from the Count, directing him to secure the best place in the coach for me. But on making inquiries as to details, he seemed somewhat reticent, and pretended that he could not understand my German. This could not be true, because up to then he had understood it perfectly. When I asked him if he knew Count Dracula, and could tell me anything of his castle, both he and his wife crossed themselves, and saying that they knew nothing at all, simply refused to speak further. Just before I was leaving, the old lady came up to my room. She went down on her knees and implored me not to go. I tried to raise her up and said as gravely as I could that I thanked her, but my duty was imperative. She then rose and dried her eyes and, taking a crucifix from her neck, offered it to me. She saw, I suppose, the doubt in my face, for she put the rosary round my neck and said, For your mother's sake. Whether it is the old lady's fear, or the many ghostly traditions of this place, or the crucifix itself, I do not know, but I am not feeling nearly as easy in my mind as usual. May the 5th. When we started, the crowd, which had by this time swelled to considerable size, all made the sign of the cross and pointed two fingers towards me. With some difficulty, I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He explained that it was a charm or guard against the evil eye. This was not very pleasant for me, just starting for an unknown place to meet an unknown man. But everyone seemed so kind-hearted and so sorrowful and so sympathetic that I could not but be touched. Then our driver cracked his whip over his horses, and we set off on our journey. The road was rugged, but still we seemed to fly over it with feverish haste. The driver was evidently bent on losing no time. 
As the evening fell, it began to get very cold. Sometimes the hills were so steep that despite our driver's haste, the horses could only go slowly. I wished to get down and walk up them, as we do at home, but the driver would not hear of it. No, he said, you must not walk here. The dogs are too fierce. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement amongst the passengers, and they kept speaking to him, one after the other, as though urging him to further speed. He lashed the horses unmercifully, and with wild cries of encouragement, urged them on to further exertions. Then, through the darkness, I could see a sort of patch of grey light ahead of us, as though there were a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs and swayed like a boat tossed on a stormy sea. Then the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side and to frown down upon us. We were entering the Borgo Pass. As we flew along, the driver leaned forward, and on each side the passengers, craning over the edge of the coach, peered eagerly into the darkness. It was evident that something very exciting was either happening or expected. But though I asked each passenger, no one would give me the slightest explanation. Then, amongst a chorus of screams from the peasants and a universal crossing of themselves, a caleche with four horses overtook us and drew up beside the coach. They were driven by a tall man with a great black hat which seemed to hide his face. I could only see the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes, which seemed red in the lamplight as he turned to us. He said to the driver, You are early tonight, my friend. As he spoke, he smiled, and the lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth as white as ivory. Give me the hare's luggage, he said, and with exceeding alacrity, my bags were handed out and put in the calash. I descended from the side of the coach, the driver helping me with a hand which caught my arm in a grip of steel. His strength must have been prodigious. Without a word he shook his reins, the horses turned and we swept into the darkness of the pass. A dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse far down the road, a long, agonized wailing, as if from fear. Then, far off in the distance, from the mountains on each side of us began a louder and sharper howling, that of wolves, which affected both the horses and myself in the same way, for I was minded to jump from the calash and run. It grew colder and colder still, and fine powdery snow began to fall, so that soon we and all around us were covered with a white blanket. The baying of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though they were closing round on us from every side. Just then the moon, sailing through the black clouds, appeared behind the jagged crest of a rock, and by its light I saw around us a ring of wolves. The horses reared and looked helplessly around, but the living ring of terror encompassed them on every side. I called to the coachman and heard his voice raised in a tone of imperious command. Looking towards the sound, I saw him stand in the roadway. As he swept his long arms, as though brushing aside some impalpable obstacle, the wolves fell back and back further still. Then a heavy cloud passed across the face of the moon, so that we were again in darkness. When I could see again, the driver was climbing into the calash, and the wolves disappeared. This was all so strange and uncanny that a dreadful fear came upon me, and I was afraid to speak or move. The time seemed interminable as we swept on our way. Suddenly, I became conscious of the fact that the driver was pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle, from whose tall black windows came no ray of light, and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the sky. When the calash stopped, the driver jumped down and held out his hand to assist me to light. Again, I could not but notice his prodigious strength. I stood close to a great door, old and studded, with large iron nails. The driver jumped again into his seat and shook the reins. The horses started forward, and trap and all disappeared down one of the dark openings. 
I stood in silence where I was, for I did not know what to do. The time I waited seemed endless, and I felt doubts and fears crowding upon me. Then I heard a heavy step approaching behind the great door, and saw through the chinks the gleam of a coming light. A key was turned with the loud grating noise of long disuse, and the great door swung back. Within stood a tall old man, clean-shaven save for a long white moustache, and clad in black from head to foot. He held in his hand an antique lamp, throwing long quivering shadows as it flickered in the draught. The old man motioned me in with a courtly gesture, saying in excellent English, but with a strange intonation. Welcome to my house. Enter freely, and of your own will. Holding out his hand, he grasped mine with a strength which made me wince, an effect which was not lessened by the fact that it seemed cold as ice. More like the hand of a dead than a living man. The strength of the handshake was so much akin to that which I had noticed in the driver, whose face I had not yet seen, that for a moment I doubted if it were not the same person. To make sure, I said, Count Dracula. He bowed. I am Dracula, and I bid you welcome, Mr. Harker, to my house. As he was speaking, he put the lamp on a bracket on the wall, and stepping out, took my luggage. I protested, but he insisted. It is late, and my people are not available. Let me see to your comfort myself. He insisted on carrying my traps along the passage, and then up a great winding stair, and along another great passage, on whose stone floor our steps rang heavily. At the end of this he threw open a heavy door, and I rejoiced to see within it a well-lit room in which a table was spread for supper, and on whose mighty hearth a great fire of logs, freshly replenished, flamed and flared. My host made a graceful wave of his hand to the table and said, I pray you be seated and sup how you please. You will excuse me that I do not join you, but I have dined already, and I do not sup. When I had finished my supper, and by my host's desire, had drawn up a chair by the fire and begun to smoke, I had an opportunity of observing him. His face was a very strong aquiline, with high bridge of the thin nose and arched nostrils. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy moustache, was fixed and rather cruel-looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth. These protruded over lips of remarkable ruddiness. The general effect was one of extraordinary pallor. A horrible feeling of nausea came over me. As I looked towards the window, I saw the first dim streak of the coming dawn. There seemed a strange stillness over everything. But as I listened, I heard as if from down below in the valley the howling of many wolves. The Count's eyes gleamed, and he said, Listen to them, the children of the night. What music they make. Seeing, I suppose, some expression in my face strange to him, he added, Ah, sir, you dwellers in the city cannot enter into the feelings of the hunter. Then he rose and said, But you must be tired. Your bedroom is ready, and tomorrow you shall sleep as late as you will. With a bow he opened the door, and I entered my bedroom. I am all in a sea of wonders. What sort of place have I come to and among what kind of people? What sort of grim adventure is it on which I have embarked? Jonathan Harker, 7th of May. I slept till late in the day and awoke of my own accord. When I had dressed, I went into the room where we had supped and found a cold breakfast laid out. There was a card on the table on which was written, I have to be absent for a while. Do not wait for me. I set to and enjoyed a hearty meal. When I had done, 
I looked for a bell so that I might let the servants know I had finished, but I could not find one. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house. In none of the rooms is there a mirror. There is not even a toilet glass on my table, and I had to get the shaving glass from my bag before I could either shave or brush my hair. I have not yet seen a servant anywhere, or heard a sound near the castle except the howling of wolves. After I had finished my meal, I looked about for something to read. There was nothing in the room, so I opened another door and found a sort of library. Whilst I was looking at the books, the door opened and the Count entered. He saluted me and hoped that I had a good night's rest. I asked if I might come into that room when I chose. He answered, You may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except where the doors are locked, where, of course, you will not wish to go. Then he went on. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways, and there shall be to you many strange things. Come, he said at last. Tell me of London and of the house which you have procured for me. With an apology for my remissness, I went into my room to get the papers from my bag. We went thoroughly into the business of the purchase of the estate of Perfleet. When he began to ask me how I had come across so suitable a place, I read to him the notes which I had made at the time. The estate is called Carfax. The house is very large, and of all periods back to medieval times. There are but few houses close at hand, one being a large house recently formed into a private lunatic asylum. It is not, however, visible from the grounds. After supper I smoked, as on the last evening, and the Count stayed with me, asking questions in every conceivable subject, hour after hour. May the 8th. I only slept a few hours when I went to bed, and feeling that I could not sleep any more, got up. I had hung my shaving glass by the window and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly I felt a hand on my shoulder and heard the Count's voice saying, Good morning. I started, for it amazed me that I had not seen him, since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. In starting I had cut myself slightly, but did not notice it at the moment. Having answered the Count's salutation, I turned to the glass again to see how I had been mistaken. This time there could be no error, for the man was close to me and I could see him over my shoulder, but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. At the instant I saw that the cut had bled a little, and the blood was trickling over my chin. When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with a sort of demonic fury, and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I drew away his hand and touched the string of beads which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, for the fury passed so quickly that I could hardly believe that it was ever there. Take care, he said. How you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. Then he withdrew without a word. When I went into the dining room, breakfast was prepared, but I could not find the Count anywhere. After breakfast, I went out on the stairs and found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent, but I am not in heart to describe beauty, for when I had seen the view I explored further. Doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all locked and bolted. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. When I found that I was a prisoner, a sort of wild feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door and peering out of every window I could find. But after a little, the conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other feelings. Presently, I heard the great door below shut and knew that the Count had returned. I went cautiously and saw him through the chink of the door laying the table in the dining room. This confirmed what I had all along thought, that there were no servants in the house. This gave me a fright, for if there is no one else in the castle... It must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. This is a terrible thought, for if so, what does it mean that he could control the wolves by only holding up his hand in silence? How was it that all the people at Bistritz and on the coach had some terrible fear for me? 
12th of May. Last evening when the Count came from his room, he began by asking me questions in legal matters and on the doing of certain kinds of business. When he had satisfied himself on the points of which he had spoken, he stood up and said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. At the door he turned and said, Let me advise you, my friend, that should you leave these rooms, you will not go to sleep in any other part of the castle. Should sleep ever overcome you, or be like to do, then haste to your own chamber, for your rest will be safe there. When he left me, I went to my room. After a little while, not hearing any sound, I came out and went up the stone stair to where I could look out towards the south. As I leaned from the window, my eye was caught by something moving a story below me, and somewhat to my left, where I imagined, from the lie of the rooms, that the windows of the Count's own room would look out. I drew back behind the stonework and looked carefully out. What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I was at first interested and somewhat amused, for it is wonderful how small a matter will interest and amuse a man when he is a prisoner. But my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over that dreadful abyss, face down with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. At first I could not believe my eyes. I thought it was some trick of the moonlight, some weird effect of shadow, but I kept looking, and it could be no delusion. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones, and by thus using every projection and inequality, move downwards with considerable speed, as a lizard moves along a wall. What manner of man is this? Or what manner of creature is it in the semblance of man? I feel the dread of this horrible place overpowering me. I am in fear, in awful fear, and there is no escape. I am encompassed about with terrors that I dare not think of. May the 15th. Once more I have seen the Count go out in his lizard fashion. I knew he had left the castle and thought to use the opportunity to explore more than I had dared to do as yet. I went down the stone stairs to the hall where I had entered originally, but the door was locked and the key was gone. That key must be in the Count's room. I went on to make a thorough examination of the various stairs and passages, and to try the doors that opened from them. At last, I found one which, though it seemed locked, gave a little under pressure. This was evidently the portion of the castle occupied by the ladies in bygone days, for the furniture had more an air of comfort than any I had seen. The Count's warning came into my mind, but I took pleasure in disobeying it. I determined not to return tonight to the gloom-haunted rooms, but to sleep here, where of old ladies had sat and sung and lived sweet lives. I drew a great couch out of its place near the corner, and unthinking of and uncaring for the dust, composed myself for sleep. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. I hope so. But I fear, for all that followed was startlingly real, so real that I cannot in the least believe that it was all sleep. I was not alone. In the moonlight opposite me were three young women, ladies by their dress and manner. I thought at the time that I must be dreaming, for though the moonlight was behind them, they threw no shadow on the floor. Two were dark, with piercing eyes that seemed almost red when contrasted with the pale yellow moon. The other was fair, with golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing and at the same time some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked, burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. They whispered together, 
and all three laughed. The fair girl shook her head coquettishly, and the other two urged her on. One said, You are first, and we shall follow. The other added, He is young and strong. There are kisses for us all. The fair girl advanced till I could feel the movement of her breath upon me. Sweet it was in one sense, honey-sweet, but with a bitter underlying the sweet, a bitter offensiveness, as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over me. There was a deliberate voluptuousness which was both thrilling and repulsive. As she arched her neck, she licked her lips like an animal. Till I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the sharp teeth. Lower and lower went her head, as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. But at that instant another sensation swept through me as quick as lightning. I was conscious of the presence of the Count and of his being as if lapped in a storm of fury. As my eyes opened involuntarily, I saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman and with giant's power draw it back. With a fierce sweep of his arm, he hurled the woman from him. How dare you touch him? How dare you cast eyes on him when I had forbidden it? Back, I tell you. This man belongs to me. Then the Count turned, looking at my face and said in a whisper, When I am done with him, you shall kiss him at your will. Are we to have nothing tonight? said one of them as she pointed to the bag which he had thrown upon the floor and which moved as though there was some living thing within it. For answer he nodded his head. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. If my ears did not deceive me, there was a gasp and a low wail as of a half-smothered child. The women closed round whilst I was aghast with horror. But as I looked, they disappeared and with them the dreadful bag. Then the horror overcame me and I sank down, unconscious. Jonathan Harker, 24th of June. Last night the Count left me early and locked himself into his own room. As soon as I dared, I ran up the winding stair and looked out. I had been at the window somewhat less than half an hour when I saw something coming out of the Count's window. I drew back and watched carefully and saw the whole man emerge and slung over his shoulder the terrible bag which I had seen the women take away. There could be no doubt as to his quest. I fled back to my own room. When a couple of hours had passed, I heard something stirring in the Count's room, something like a sharp wail quickly suppressed. And then there was silence, deep, awful silence, which chilled me. I sat down and simply cried. Then I thought I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it softly and listened. I heard the voice of the Count. Tomorrow night is yours. There was a low, sweet ripple of laughter, and in a rage I threw open the door and saw without the three terrible women licking their lips. As I appeared, they all joined in a horrible laugh. I came back to my room and threw myself on my knees. It is then so near the end. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. 25th of June. I must take action of some sort whilst the courage of the day is upon me. I have seen him myself crawl from his window. 
Why should not I imitate him and go in by his window? I shall risk it. Goodbye, Mina. If I fail... I knew pretty well the direction and distance of the Count's window, and made for it as well as I could. I was filled with agitation when I slid feet foremost in through the window. I looked around for the Count, but with gladness and surprise made a discovery. The room was empty. I looked for the key, but I could not find it anywhere. At one corner of the room was a heavy door. It was open, and led through a stone passage to a circular stairway, which went steeply down. At the bottom I pulled open a heavy door and found myself in an old ruined chapel which had evidently been used as a graveyard. In two places were steps leading to vaults, but the ground had recently been dug over and the earth placed in great wooden boxes. I went down even into the vaults where the dim light struggled, although to do so was a dread to my very soul. Into two of these I went, but saw nothing except fragments of old coffins and piles of dust. In the third, however, I made a discovery. There, in one of the great boxes, lay the Count, either dead or asleep, I could not say, but as if his youth had been half renewed. The white hair and moustache were changed to dark iron grey, the cheeks were fuller, and the white skin seemed ruby red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever, for on the lips were gouts of fresh blood, which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran down over the chin and neck. It seemed as if the whole awful creature was simply gorged with blood. He lay like a filthy leech, exhausted with his repletion. I shuddered as I bent over to touch him, and every sense in me revolted at the contact but I had to search or I was lost. The coming night might see my own body a banquet in a similar way to those horrid three. I felt all over the body, but no sign could I find of the key. Then I stopped and looked at the Count. There was a mocking smile on the bloated face which seemed to drive me mad. I seized a shovel and, lifting it high, struck with the edge downward at the hateful face. But as I did so, the head turned, and the eyes fell upon me with all their blaze of basilisk horror. The shovel fell from my hand across the box, and as I pulled it away, the blade caught the edge of the lid, which fell over and hid the horrid thing from my sight. The last glimpse I had was of the bloated face, blood-stained and fixed with a grin of malice, which would have held its own in the nethermost hell. I ran from the place and gained the Count's room. I thought and thought what should be my next move, but my brain seemed on fire. In the distance I heard a gypsy song coming closer, and the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips. With strained ears I listened, and heard downstairs the grinding of the key in the great lock, and the falling back of the heavy door. As I write there is in the passage below a sound of many tramping feet, and the crash of weights being set down heavily, doubtless the boxes with their freight of earth. There is a sound of hammering. The door is shut. The chains rattle. I hear the creaking of lock and bolt. I am alone in the castle with those awful women. Those devils of the pit. I shall not remain alone with them. I shall try to scale the castle wall farther than I have yet attempted and then away from this cursed land where the devil and his children still walk with earthly feet. At least God's mercy is better than that of those monsters, and the precipice is steep and high. At its foot a man may sleep, as a man. Goodbye, all. Mina. Mina Murray, 24th of July, Whitby. Lucy met me at the station, and we drove up to the house at the Crescent, in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river runs through a deep valley, which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. Right over the town is Whitby Abbey, a most noble ruin of immense size. 
Between it and the town, there is a church, round which is a graveyard. This is, to my mind, the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town and has a full view of the harbour and all up the bay. There are walks with seats beside them, through the churchyard, and people go and sit there all day long, looking at the beautiful view and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here often myself. Twenty-sixth of July. I came up here an hour ago with Lucy, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat, and she told me all over again about her three suitors. They are, as it turns out, great friends: Doctor Seward, the lunatic asylum man, Mister Quincy Morris, the American from Texas, and of course Arthur himself, Arthur Homewood, Lord Godalming. Lucy spoke so happily about Arthur and their coming marriage. That made me just a little heartsick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for such a long time. Doctor Seward's diary, kept in phonograph. Perfect asylum. Since Lucy's rebuff, I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems of sufficient importance to be worth the doing. As I knew that the only cure for this sort of thing was work. I went amongst the patients. The case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. Just now, his hobby is catching flies. Eighteenth of June. He's turned his mind now to spiders. He keeps feeding them his flies, and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished. He disgusted me much while with him, for when a horrid blowfly, bloated with some carrion food, buzzed into the room, he caught it. Held it exultingly for a few moments between his finger and thumb, and before I knew what he was going to do, put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him, but he argued that it was very good and very wholesome, that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiment of one. Eighth of July. He's managed to get a sparrow, and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming is simple, for already the spiders have diminished. Nineteenth of July. My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favour. I asked him what it was, and he said, with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, "A kitten, a nice little kitten that I can play with and teach and feed." I was not unprepared for this request, for I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size and vivacity. But I did not care that his pretty family of sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and spiders. So I shook my head, and said that at present, I feared it would not be possible. His face fell, and I could see a warning of danger in it. Twentieth of July. Visited Renfield very early before the attendant went his rounds. Found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved, in the window, and was manifestly beginning his fly catching again, and beginning it cheerfully and with a good grace. I looked around for his birds, and not seeing them, asked him where they were. He replied without turning around, that they had all flown away. I said nothing. But went and told the keeper to report to me if there was anything odd about him during the day. Eleven a.m. The attendant has just been to see me to say that Renfield has been very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, doctor, he said, that he's eaten his birds, and that he just took them and ate them raw. The thought that has been buzzing about my brain is complete. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. How well the man reasoned! He has closed the account most accurately, and today begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? Oh, Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours. But I must only wait on, hopeless, and work. Work. Twenty sixth of July. Lucy, although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. 
Arthur is coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town, and I think poor Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. I dare say it is the waiting which disturbs her. Twenty seventh of July. No news from Jonathan. I'm getting quite uneasy about him, though why I do not know. But I do wish that he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I am awakened by her moving about the room. The anxiety and the petulantly being awakened is beginning to tell on me, and I am getting nervous and wakeful myself. Sixth of August. This suspense is getting dreadful. Oh, I do hope he's not ill. He surely would have written. If I only knew where to write to or where to go, I, I should feel easier. I must only pray to God for patience. Last night was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we're in for a storm. Just now, the coast guard came along with his spyglass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me as he always does, but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. I can't make her out, he said. She's a Russian by the look of her, but she's knocking about in the queerest way. She's steered mighty strangely. We'll hear more of her before this time tomorrow. Mina Murray, cutting from the Daily Graph, Whitby, eighth of August. One of the greatest and saddest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. Yesterday evening there was a sultry heat, and that prevailing intensity which, on the approach of thunder, affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but few lights at sea, for even the coasting steamers kept well to seaward. And but few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner with all sails set. Shortly before midnight, the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. With a rapidity which seemed incredible, the whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. Before long, the searchlight discovered some distance away the schooner with all sails set. And a shudder ran through all who saw her, for lashed to the helm was a corpse, with drooping head, which swung horribly, to and fro, at each motion of the ship. There was a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up on the sand heap. Every spar, rope, and stay was strained, and some of the top hammer came crashing down. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched. An immense dog sprang up on deck from below, and running forward, jumped from the bow onto the sand, making straight for the steep cliff. It disappeared in the darkness. By the courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck. The man was fastened by his hands, tied one over the other to a spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix. The set of beads on which it was fastened being around both wrists and wheel, and all kept fast by the binding cords. In his pocket was a bottle, carefully corked, empty, save for a little roll of paper, which proved to be the addendum to the log. As there is no motive for concealment, I accordingly append a transcript, translated by a clerk of the Russian consul. Log of the Demeter, Varna to Whitby, sixth July. Finished taking in cargo, silver sand and boxes of earth. At noon set sail. Crew: five hands, two mates, cook, and myself. Thirteenth July. Crew dissatisfied about something. Seemed scared, but would not speak out. Fourteenth July. Somewhat anxious about crew. Men all steady fellows who sailed with me before, mate could not make out what was wrong. They only told him there was something aboard and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with one of them and struck him. Expected fierce quarrel, 
but all was quiet. 16th July. Mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Men all said they expected something of the kind, but would not say more than that there was something aboard. Mate, getting very impatient with them, feared some trouble ahead. 17th July. One of the men, Olgarin, came to my cabin, and in an awestruck way confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch he'd been sheltering behind the deckhouse as there was a rainstorm, and he saw a tall, thin man, who was not like any of the crew, come up the companionway and go along the deck for it. He followed cautiously, but when he got to the bowers, found no one, and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear, and I'm afraid the panic may spread. Later in the day I got together the whole crew and told them, as they evidently thought there was someone in the ship, we would search from stem to stern. First mate angry said it was folly, and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralise the men. I let him take the helm while the rest began a thorough search, all keeping abreast with lanterns. We left no corner unsearched. Men much relieved went search over, and went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled, but said nothing. 24th July. There seems some doom over this ship. Already a hand short, and entering the Bay of Biscay with wild weather ahead, and yet last night another man lost, disappeared. Men all in a panic of fear, asking to have double watch, as they feared to be alone. 29th July. Another tragedy. Had single watch tonight as crew too tired to double. When morning watch came on deck, could find no one except steersmen. Raised outcry and all came on deck. Thorough search, but no one found. Are now without second mate and crew in a panic. Mate and I agreed to go armed henceforth and wait for any sign of course. 30th July. Awakened by mate telling me that both man of watch and steersman missing. Only self and mate and two hands left to work ship. 2nd August, midnight. Woke up from few minutes sleep by hearing a cry seemingly outside my port. Could see nothing in fog. Rushed on deck and ran against mate. Tells me he heard cry and ran, but no sign of man on watch. One more gone. Lord, help us. 3rd of August. At midnight, I went to relieve the man at the wheel, and when I got to it, found no one there. I dared not leave it, so shouted for the mate. He rushed up on deck. He looked wild-eyed and haggard, and I greatly fear his reason has given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely, it is here. On the watch last night I saw it, like a man, tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bows, and looking out, I crept behind it and gave it my knife. But the knife went through it, empty as the air. But it is here, and I'll find it. It is in the hole, in one of those boxes. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. And with a warning look he went below. He is mad, stark raving mad, and it's no use my trying to stop him. I can only trust in God and wait till the fog clears. It is nearly all over now. Just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, there came up the hatchway a sudden startled scream, which made my blood run cold. And upon deck he came as if shot from a gun, a raging madman with his eyes rolling and his face convulsed with fear. Save me, save me, he cried. He is here. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him. It is all that is left. Before I could say a word and move forward to seize him, he sprang on the bulwark and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret too now. It was this madman who had got rid of the men one by one, and now he has followed them himself. 
4th of August. I dared not leave the helm, so here all night I stayed. And in the dimness of the night, I saw it, him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a man, to die like a sailor in blue water. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend, for I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail, and along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch. And then, come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul and my honour as a captain. The verdict was an open one. There is no evidence to adduce, and whether or not the man himself committed the murders, there is now no one to say. No trace has ever been found of the great dog which landed when the ship struck. 11th of August. We have had such an adventure, such an agonising experience. I was awakened suddenly in the night and sat up with a horrible sense of fear upon me. The room was dark, so I could not see Lucy's bed. I stole across and felt for her. The bed was empty. I ran downstairs and looked in the sitting room. Not there. Then I looked in all the other rooms of the house with an ever-growing fear chilling my heart. Finally, I came to the hall door and found it open. I took a big, heavy shawl and ran out. At the edge of the west cliff, above the pier, I looked across the harbour to the east cliff, in the hope, or fear, I don't know which, of seeing Lucy in our favourite seat. There was a bright, full moon with heavy black driving clouds. For a moment or two I could see nothing, as the shadow of a cloud obscured the church and all around it. But then, as the cloud passed, the church and churchyard became visible. There, on our favourite seat, the silver light of the moon struck a half-reclining figure, snowy white. The coming of the cloud was too quick for me to see much, for shadow shut down on light almost immediately, but it seemed to me as though something dark stood behind the seat where the white figure shone and bent over it. What it was, whether man or beast, I could not tell. The time and distance seemed endless as I toiled up the steps to the abbey. I must have gone fast, and yet it seemed to me as if my feet were weighted with lead. When I got almost to the top, I could see the seat and the white figure. There was undoubtedly something long and black bending over the half-reclining white figure. I called in fright, Lucy? Lucy! And something raised a head, and from where I was, I could see a white face and red, gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer, and I ran on to the entrance of the churchyard. As I entered, the church was between me and the seat, and for a minute or so I lost sight of her. When I came in view again, the cloud had passed, and the moonlight struck so brilliantly that I could see Lucy half reclining, with her head lying over the back of the seat. She was quite alone, and there was not a sign of any living thing about. When I bent over her, I could see that she was still asleep. Her lips were parted, and she was breathing in long, heavy gasps, as though striving to get her lungs full at every breath. As I came close, she put up her hand in her sleep and pulled the collar of her nightdress close around her, as though she felt the cold. I flung the warm shawl over her and drew the edges tight around her neck, for I dreaded lest she should get some deadly chill from the night air. I fastened the shawl at her throat with a big safety pin, but I must have been clumsy in my anxiety and pinched or pricked her with it, for by and by, when her breathing became quieter, she put her hand to her throat again and moaned. Same day, noon. Lucy slept till I woke her. I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the safety pin hurt her. 
I must have pinched up a piece of loose skin and have transfixed it, for there are two little red points, like pinpricks, and on the band of her nightdress, a drop of blood. Mina Murray, 17th of August. Some sort of shadowy pall seems to be coming over our happiness. No news from Jonathan, and Lucy seems to be growing weaker. At night, I hear her gasping as if for air. I trust her feeling ill may not be from that unlucky prick of the safety pin. I looked at her throat just now as she lay asleep, and the tiny wounds seem not to have healed. They are still open and, if anything, larger than before, and the edges of them are faintly white. 19th of August. Joy, joy, joy! At last, news of Jonathan. The dear fellow has been ill. That is why he did not write. I am to leave in the morning and go over to him, and to help to nurse him if necessary, and to bring him home. My journey is all mapped out and my luggage ready. Dr. Seward, 19th of August. I heard the clock strike twice when the night watchman came to me to say that Brenfield had escaped. I threw on my clothes and ran down at once. The attendant told me the patient had gone to the left and had taken a straight line, so I ran as quickly as I could. As I got through the belt of trees, I saw a white figure scale the high wall which separates our grounds from those of the deserted house. Crossing the wall... I dropped down on the other side into the grounds of Carfax. I could see Renfield's figure just disappearing behind the angle of the house, so I ran after him. On the far side of the house, I found him pressed close against the old iron-bound oak door of the chapel. As I ventured to draw near him, I heard him say, I am here to do your bidding, Master. I've worshipped you long and afar off. Now that you are near, I await your commands. Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra. Hospital of St. Joseph and St. Mary, Budapest, 24th of August. My dearest Lucy, I know you will be anxious to hear all that has happened since we parted at Whitby. I found my dear one, oh, so thin and pale and weak-looking. He is only a wreck of himself, and he does not remember anything that has happened to him for a long time past or at least he wants me to believe so, and I shall never ask. He has had some terrible shock, and I fear it might tax his poor brain if he were to try to recall it. Lucy, dear, the chaplain of the English Mission Church has been sent for. We are to be married in an hour. Arthur Homewood to Dr. Seward 31st of August My dear Jack, I want you to do me a favour. Lucy is ill. Well, that is, she has no special illness, but ever since our return from Whitby she has looked awful. And she is getting worse every day. I told her I should ask you to see her, and she finally consented. It will be a painful task for you, old friend. But it is for her sake. Letter. Dr. John Seward to Arthur Homewood. 2nd of September. My dear fellow, with regard to Miss Westenra's health, I hasten to let you know at once that there is not any functional disturbance or any malady that I know of. At the same time, I am not by any means satisfied with her appearance. I am in doubt, and so have done the very best thing I know of. I have written to my old friend and master, Professor Van Helsing of Amsterdam. He's a philosopher and a metaphysician, and one of the most advanced scientists of his day. I've asked him to come at once. Dr. Seward's Diary 7th of September Van Helsing came with me to Hillingham, and we were shown up to Lucy's room. If I was shocked when I saw her yesterday, I was horrified when I saw her today. She was ghastly, chalkily pale. The red seemed to have gone even from her lips and gums, and the bones of her face stood out prominently, 
Her breathing was painful to see or hear. Van Helsing beckoned to me, and we went gently out of the room. There's no time to be lost, he said. She will die for sheer want of blood. There must be a transfusion at once. When we reached the hall, Arthur was stepping quickly in. The professor said to him gravely, Sir, you have come in time. You are the lover of our dear miss. She is bad, very bad. She wants blood, and blood she must have or die. We all went up to Lucy's room, and with swiftness but absolute method, Van Helsing performed the operation. When all was over, I could see how much Arthur was weakened. I dressed the wound and took his arm to bring him away. Van Helsing adjusted the pillow to the patient's head. As he did so, the narrow black velvet band which she seemed always to wear round her throat was dragged up a little and showed a red mark on her throat. Arthur did not notice it, but I could hear the deep hiss of indrawn breath, which is one of Van Helsing's ways of betraying emotion. Just over the external jugular vein, there were two punctures. 8th of September. I sat up all night with Lucy. She never stirred, but slept on and on in a deep, tranquil sleep. In the early morning her maid came, and I took myself back home. I sent a short wire to Van Helsing and to Arthur, telling them of the excellent result of the operation. 9th of September. I was pretty tired and worn out when I got to Hillingham. For two nights I'd hardly slept a wink of sleep. Lucy was up and in cheerful spirits. When she shook hands with me, she looked sharply in my face and said, No sitting up tonight for you. You're worn out. She took me upstairs and showed me a room next to her own. I could not but acquiesce, for I was dog-tired. So I lay on the sofa and forgot all about everything. 10th of September. I was conscious of the professor's hand on my head and started awake all in a second. And how is our patient? Well, when I left her, I answered. And together we went into the room. As I raised the blind and the morning sunlight flooded the room, I heard the professor's low hiss of inspiration. There, on the bed, seemingly in a swoon, lay poor Lucy, more horribly white and wan-looking than ever. Even the lips were white, and the gums seemed to have shrunken back from the teeth. All our work is undone. We must start again. 18th of September. I never saw in all my experience the professor work in such deadly earnest. I knew, as he knew, that it was a stand-up fight with death, and told him so. He answered me in a way that I did not understand, but with the sternest look that his face could wear. If that were all, I would stop where we are now and let her fade away into peace. He went on with his work with, if possible, renewed and more frenzied vigour. We must consult as to what is to be done, he said as we descended the stairs. He was evidently torturing his mind about something. We must have another transfusion of blood. You're exhausted already. I'm exhausted too. What are we to do for someone who will open his veins for her? What's the matter with me, anyhow? The tones brought relief and gladness to my heart, for they were those of Quincy Morris. What brought you here, I cried as our hands met. I guess art is the cause. He handed me a telegram. Have not heard from Seward in three days, and am terribly anxious. Send me word how Lucy is. Do not delay homeward. I think I just came in the nick of time. You've only to tell me what to do. And once more we went through that ghastly operation. 19th of September. All last night she slept fitfully. The professor and I took it in turns to watch, and never left her for a moment unattended. In the afternoon she asked for Arthur and we telegraphed for him. When he saw her, Arthur was simply choking with emotion, and none of us could speak. 20th of September. I relieved Van Helsing in his watch over Lucy. I sat down beside her, and presently she moved uneasily. At the same moment there came a sort of dull flapping or buffeting at the window, 
I went over and peeped out by the corner of the blind. There was a full moonlight, and I could see that the noise was made by a great bat, which wheeled around, doubtless attracted by the light, and every now and again struck the window with its wings. At six o'clock Van Helsing came to relieve me. He bent down, and with his face almost touching Lucy's, examined her carefully. Then he turned to me and said calmly, She is dying. It will not be long now. Wake that poor boy and let him come and see the last. I went to the dining room and waked Arthur. I told him as gently as I could that both Van Helsing and I feared the end was near. He covered his face with his hands, whilst his shoulders shook with grief. Come, I said. My dear old fellow, summon all your fortitude. It will be best and easiest for her. When we came into Lucy's room, she opened her eyes, and seeing him whispered softly, Arthur, oh, my love, I'm so glad you have come. He was stooping to kiss her when Van Helsing motioned him back. No, not yet. Hold her hand. It will comfort her more. So Arthur took her hand and knelt beside her. Then gradually her eyes closed and she sank to sleep. For a little bit her breast heaved softly, and her breath came and went like a tired child's. And then her breathing grew stertorous. The mouth opened and the pale gums, drawn back, made the teeth look longer and sharper than ever. In a sort of sleepwalking, vague, unconscious way she opened her eyes, which were now dull and hard at once, and said in a soft, voluptuous voice, Arthur, oh, my love, I'm so glad you've come. Kiss me. Arthur bent eagerly over to kiss her, but at that instant Van Helsing swooped upon him and dragged him back with a fury of strength which I have never thought he could have possessed, and actually hurled him almost across the room. Not on your life, he said. Not for your living soul and hers. Arthur was so taken aback that he did not for a moment know what to do or say. I kept my eyes fixed on Lucy, as did Van Helsing, and we saw a spasm, as of a rage flit like a shadow across her face. The sharp teeth clamped together, then her eyes closed and she breathed heavily. Very shortly, after she opened her eyes in all their softness, and putting out her poor, pale, thin hand, took Van Helsing's. Drawing it close to her, she kissed it. My true friend, she said in a faint voice. My true friend and his. Oh, guard him and give me peace. And then Lucy's breathing became stertorous again, and all at once it ceased. It is all over, said Van Helsing. She is dead. I stood beside him and said, Poor girl. There is peace for her at last. It is the end. He turned to me and said with grave solemnity, Not so, alas. Not so. It is only the beginning. Mina Harker, 22nd of September. It seems only yesterday that the last entry was made, and yet how much between then? In Whitby and all the world before me, Jonathan away and no news of him, and now, married to Jonathan and returned to England, and Jonathan with another attack that may harm him. We came back to town quietly and walked down Piccadilly. Jonathan was holding me by the arm the way he used to. I was looking at a very beautiful girl sitting in a Victoria outside Giuliano's when I felt Jonathan clutch my arm so tight that he hurt me and he said under his breath, My God. He was very pale as, half in terror and half in amazement, 
he gazed at a tall, thin man with a black moustache and pointed beard, who was also observing the pretty girl. He was looking at her so hard that he did not see either of us, and so I had a good view of him. His face was hard and cruel and sensual, and his teeth were pointed like an animal's. I asked Jonathan why he was disturbed, and he answered, Do you see who it is? The poor dear was evidently terrified at something, very greatly terrified. I do believe that if he had not had me to support him, he would have sunk down. Jonathan kept looking after him, and he said, as if to himself, I believe it is the Count, but he has grown young. My God, if this be so. He was distressing himself so much that I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him any questions, so I drew him away, quietly. I must not ask him, but I must somehow learn the facts of his journey abroad. The time is come, I fear, when I must open the diary he kept and know what is written. Oh, Jonathan, you will forgive me if I do wrong, but it is for your own dear sake. Later. Jonathan, still pale and dizzy under the relapse of his malady, and now a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. You will be grieved to hear that Miss Lucy Westenra died the day before yesterday. Oh, what a wealth of sorrow in a few words. Poor Lucy. God, help us all to bear our troubles. Dr. Seward, 22nd of September. It is all over. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin, in a lonely churchyard away from teeming London, where the air is fresh and the sun rises over Hampstead Hill. 24th of September. I hadn't the heart to write last night. That terrible record of Jonathan's upset me so. How he must have suffered. Whether it be true or only imagination. I wonder if there's any truth in it at all. Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker. 24th September. Dear Madam, I pray you to pardon my writing, but I am deeply concerned about certain matters vitally important. May it be that I see you. I am a friend of Dr. John Seward and Lord Godalming. I should come to Exeter to see you at once, if you tell me I am privileged to come. 25th of September. It was half past two when the knock came. In a few minutes, Mary opened the door and announced Dr. Van Helsing. I rose and bowed, and he came towards me. Madam Mina, it is on account of the dead that I come. Sir, I said, you could have no better claim on me than that you were a friend and helper of Lucy Westenra. I asked him what it was that he wanted to see me about. So he at once began. I have read your letters to Miss Lucy. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary, and in that diary she traces by inference certain things to a sleepwalking in which she puts down that you saved her. In great perplexity, then, I come to you and ask you to tell me all that you can remember. When it came to speaking to this great learned man, I began to fear that he would think me a fool. But he had promised to help, and I trusted him, so I said, Dr. Van Helsing, what I have to tell you is so queer that you must not laugh at me. You must not think me foolish that I have even half believed some very strange things. He reassured me by his manner as well as his words when he said, Oh, my dear, I have learned not to think little of anyone's belief, no matter how strange it may be. Thank you, thank you a thousand times. You have taken a weight off my mind. 
If you will let me, I shall give you a paper to read. It will tell you my trouble and Jonathan's. It is the copy of his journal when abroad. Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker, 25th September, 6 o'clock. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. You may sleep without doubt, strange and terrible as it is. It is true. Jonathan Harker, September the 26th. I thought never to write in this diary again, but the time has come. Mina told me of Van Helsing's visit. It seems to have made a new man of me. It was the doubt as to the reality of the whole thing that knocked me over. I felt impotent and in the dark, and distrustful. But now that I know, I am not afraid, even of the Count. He has succeeded after all, then, in his design in getting to London, and it was he I saw. Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out. Dr. Seward, 26th of September. Van Helsing almost bounded into the room and thrust last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. What do you think of that? he asked. He pointed out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. It did not convey much to me until I reached a passage where it described small puncture wounds on their throats. Well, he said, it is like poor Lucy's. He stood up and said solemnly, would it were so? But alas, no, it is worse. Far, far worse. 29th of September. Last night, a little before ten o'clock, Arthur and Quincy came into Van Helsing's room. He began by saying that he hoped we would all come with him, for, he said, there is a grave duty to be done. I want your permission to do what I think good this night. It is, I know, much to ask, and when you know what it is I propose to do, you will know how much. It was just before twelve o'clock when we got into the churchyard. When we'd come close to the tomb, I looked at Arthur, for I feared the proximity to a place laden with so sorrowful a memory would upset him, but he bore himself well. The professor unlocked the door, and seeing a natural hesitation amongst us, solved the difficulty by entering first. The rest of us followed, and he closed the door. He then lit a dark lantern and pointed to a coffin. Arthur stepped forward hesitatingly. The professor took his screwdriver and took off the lid of the coffin. Arthur looked on, very pale but silent. When the lid was removed, we all looked in and recoiled. The coffin was empty. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Professor, is this your doing? I swear to you by all that I hold sacred that I have not removed or touched her. But bear with me. So far there is much that is strange. Things much stranger are yet to be. So, here he shut the dark slide of his lantern. Now to the outside. He opened the door and we filed out. We took the places assigned to us close round the tomb, but hidden from the sight of anyone approaching. There was a spell of silence, and then from the professor, a keen <sniffs> He pointed, and far down the avenue of yews, we saw a white figure advance, a dim white figure, which held something dark at its breast. The figure stopped, and at the moment a ray of moonlight fell, and showed in startling prominence a dark-haired woman dressed in the cerements of the grave. We could not see the face, for it was bent down over what we saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a pause, and a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in sleep. We were starting forward, but the professor's warning hand kept us back. The white figure moved forwards again. It was now near enough for us to see clearly, and the moonlight still held. My own heart grew cold as ice, and I could hear the gasp of Arthur as we recognized the features 
of Lucy Westenra. Lucy Westenra, but yet how changed. The sweetness was turned to adamantine heartless cruelty, and the purity to voluptuous wantonness. Van Helsing raised his lantern and drew the slide. By the concentrated light that fell on Lucy's face, we could see that the lips were crimson with fresh blood, and that the stream had trickled over her chin and stained the purity of her lawn death robe. We shuddered with horror. When Lucy saw us, she drew back with an angry snarl. Then her eyes ranged over us. Lucy's eyes in form and colour, but unclean and full of hellfire, instead of the pure, gentle orbs we knew. As she looked, her face became wreathed with a voluptuous smile. Oh, God, how it made me shudder to see it. With a careless motion, she flung to the ground, callous as a devil, the child that up to now she had clutched strenuously to her breast, growling over it as a dog growls over a bone. The child gave a sharp cry and lay there moaning. There was a cold-bloodedness in the act which wrung a groan from Arthur. When she advanced to him with outstretched arms and a wanton smile, he fell back. Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others and come to me. There was something diabolically sweet in her tones, which rang through the brains even of us who had heard the words addressed to another. As for Arthur, he seemed under a spell. He opened wide his arms. She was leaping for them when Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them his crucifix. She recoiled from it and with a suddenly distorted face full of rage dashed past him to enter the tomb. We all looked on with horrified amazement as we saw the woman with a corporeal body as real at the moment as our own pass through the interstice where scarce a knife blade could have gone. All was silent. And then, lifting the child, the professor spoke. Come, my friends. We can do no more until tomorrow. Dr. Seward, 29th of September, night. We got to the graveyard by half past one and silently followed the professor to the tomb. When he again lifted the lid off Lucy's coffin, we all looked, Arthur trembling like an aspen, and saw that the corpse lay there in all its death beauty. But there was no love in my own heart, nothing but loathing for the foul thing which had taken Lucy's shape without her soul. I could see even Arthur's face grow hard as he looked. Presently he said to Van Helsing, Is this really Lucy's body, or only a demon in her shape? It is her body, and yet not it. But wait a while, and you shall see her as she was. She seemed like a nightmare of Lucy as she lay there. The pointed teeth, the blood-stained voluptuous mouth, the whole carnal and unspirited appearance seeming like a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. Van Helsing, with his usual methodicalness, began taking the various contents from his bag. When all was ready, he said, Before we do anything, let me tell you this. It is out of the lore and experience of the ancients and all of those who have studied the powers of the undead. When they become such, there comes with a change the curse of immortality. They cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims and multiplying the evils of the world. For all that die from the praying of the undead become themselves undead. And so the circle goes on, ever widening. But when this now undead be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady shall again be free. Instead of working wickedness, she shall take her place with the other angels. It will be a blessed hand for her that shall strike the blow that sets her free. To this I am willing... But is there none amongst us who has a better right? 
Arthur stepped forward and said bravely, though his hand trembled and his face was as pale as snow, My true friend, tell me what I am to do, and I shall not falter. Van Helsing laid a hand on his shoulder and said, Brave lad, take this stake in your left hand, ready to place the point over the heart and the hammer in your right. Then when we begin our prayer for the dead, strike in God's name. Arthur took the stake and the hammer, and when once his mind was set on action, his hands never trembled. Van Helsing opened his missile and began to read, and Quincy and I followed as well as we could. Arthur placed the point over the heart, and as I looked I could see its dint in the white flesh. Then he struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed, and a hideous, blood-curdling screech came from the opened red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortions. The sharp, white teeth champed together till the lips were cut and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam. But Arthur never faltered. His untrembling arm rose and fell, driving deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake, whilst the blood from the pierced heart whirled and spurted up around it. His face was set and high duty seemed to shine through it. Finally, the terrible task was over. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. There, in the coffin, lay no longer the foul thing that we had so dreaded. But Lucy, as we had seen her in life, with her face of unequalled sweetness and purity. Van Helsing came and laid his hand on Arthur's shoulder and said, And now, my child, you may kiss her. No longer she is the devil's undead. She is God's true dead, whose soul is with him. Arthur bent and kissed her. And then we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb. The professor and I sawed the top of the stake, leaving the point of it in the body. Then we cut off the head and filled the mouth with garlic. We screwed on the coffin lid and, gathering up our belongings, came away. Outside the air was sweet. The sun shone and the birds sang, and it seemed as if all nature were tuned to a different pitch. Before we moved away, Van Helsing said, Now, my friends, one step of our work is done, but there remains a greater task, to find the author of all this our sorrow and to stamp him out. Two nights hence you shall meet with me. I shall entreat two others, and then begins our great quest. Mina Harker, 30th of September, Perfleet Asylum. When we met in Dr. Seward's study, we formed a sort of committee. Professor Van Helsing took the head of the table, to which Dr. Seward motioned him as he came in. He made me sit next to him and asked me to act as secretary. Jonathan sat next to me. Opposite us were Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris. The professor said, I may take it that we are all acquainted with the facts. We expressed assent, and he went on. Then it were, I think, good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. There are such beings as vampires. Even had we not the proof of our own unhappy experiences, the teachings and records of the past give proof enough. This vampire which is amongst us is of himself so strong as twenty men, of cunning more than mortal, he is brute, and more than brute, he is devil in callous. He can, within limitations, appear at will when and where and in any of the forms that are to him. He can at times vanish and come unknown. He throws no shadow, he make in the mirror no reflect. He can transform himself to wolf. He can be as bat. He can come in mist. He can do all these things, yet he is not free. He cannot go where he lists, he may not enter at the first, unless there be someone of the household who bid him to come. His power ceases at the coming of the day. Then there are things which so afflict him that he has no power. 
such as the garlic that we know of, and this symbol, my crucifix. As for the stake through him, we know already of its peace, or the cut-off head that giveth rest. We have seen it with our eyes. And now we must settle what we do. We know from the inquiry of Jonathan that from the castle to Whitby came fifty boxes of earth. We must trace each of these boxes and we must sterilise the earth so that no more he can seek safety in it. Thus in the end we may find him in his form of man between the hours of noon and sunset and so engage with him when he is at his most weak. My friends, there is a terrible task before us and once our feet are on the ploughshare, we must not draw back. 1st of October Just as we were about to leave the house, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once, as he had something of the utmost importance to say to me. He had shown some improvement in recent days, since the arrival of Mrs. Harker, who out of the kindness of her heart had taken to visiting him. Now, however, I found him in a state of considerable excitement. His request was that I would at once release him from the asylum and send him home. When he found that his appeal would not be successful, he got into quite a frantic condition. Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward. Oh, let me implore you to let me out of this house at once. Can't you understand? I am no lunatic in a mad fit, but a sane man fighting for his soul. I thought that the longer this went on, the wilder he would get, so I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said sternly. No more of this. Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. He looked at me intently for several moments. Then without a word he rose and sat down on the side of the bed. When I was leaving the room he said to me in a quiet voice, You will, I trust, Dr. Seward, do me the justice to bear in mind later on that I did what I could to convince you tonight. Jonathan Harker, 1st of October, 5 a.m. I went with the party to search with an easy mind, for I think I never saw Mina so absolutely strong and well. I'm so glad she consented to hold back and let us men do the work. Having passed the wall, we took our way to the house, taking care to keep in the shadows of the trees when the moonlight shone out. When we got to the porch, the professor opened his bag. My friends, we are going into terrible danger, and we need arms of many kinds. Keep this near your heart. As he spoke, he lifted a little silver crucifix and held it out to me. Put these flowers round your neck. Here he handed to me a wreath of withered garlic blossoms. And above all, this, which we must not desecrate needless. This was a portion of sacred wafer, which he put in an envelope and handed to me. Each of the others was similarly equipped. With a little trouble we opened the door and set about our work. We made an accurate examination of the place, the professor saying, The first thing is to see how many of the boxes are left. A glance was sufficient to show how many remained, for the great earth chests were bulky, and there was no mistaking them. There were only twenty-nine left out of the fifty. The house was silent when we got back. I came tiptoe into our own room and found Mina asleep, breathing so softly that I had to put my ear down to hear it. She looks paler than usual. I hope the meeting tonight has not upset her. 1st of October I can't quite remember how I fell asleep last night. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dogs and a lot of queer sounds. And then there was silence over everything. Silence so profound that it startled me, and I got up and looked out of the window. Not a thing seemed to be stirring, but all to be grim and fixed as death or fate so that a thin streak of white mist that crept across the grass towards the house seemed to have a sentience and a vitality of its own. I was so frightened that I crept into bed and pulled the clothes over my head, and so I slept uneasily 
and thought. It began to dawn upon me that the air was heavy and dank and cold. I put back the clothes from my face and found, to my surprise, that all was dim around. The gaslight which I'd left lit for Jonathan came only like a tiny red spark through the fog, which had evidently grown thicker and poured into the room. Then it occurred to me that I'd shut the window before I'd come to bed. The mist grew thicker and thicker, and I could see now how it came in. Not through the window, but through the joinings of the door. It seemed as if it became concentrated into a sort of pillar of cloud in the room, through the top of which I could see the light of the gas shining. As I looked, the fire d- Jonathan Harker, 2nd of October, evening. A long and trying and exciting day. I had managed to track down one of the workmen who had transported the boxes from Carfax. He was a smart enough fellow, though rough of speech and bearing. When I had promised to pay for his information, he told me that he had made two journeys between Carfax and a house in Piccadilly, and he had taken nine great boxes with a horse and cart hired by him for this purpose. I found all the others at home. When I had told them of my discovery, Van Helsing said, This has been a great day's work, friend Jonathan. Doubtless we are on the track of the missing boxes. Dr. Seward, 3rd of October. Let me put down with exactness all that happened. Not a detail must be forgotten. In all calmness, I must proceed. Late last night, the attendant came bursting into my room and told me that Renfield had met with some accident. When I came to Renfield's room, I found him lying on the floor in a glittering pool of blood. When I went to move him, it became at once apparent that he had received some terrible injuries. As the face was exposed, I could see that it was horribly bruised, as though it had been beaten against the floor. The attendant, who was kneeling beside the body, said to me as we turned him over, I think, sir, his back is broken. I said to him, Go to Dr. Van Helsing and ask him to come here at once. The man ran off, and within a few minutes the professor appeared. We went into a strict examination of the patient. As we did so, there was a tapping at the door. I went over and opened it and found in the corridor without Arthur and Quincy. The former spoke. I heard your man call Dr. Van Helsing and tell him of an accident. When Quincy saw the attitude and state of the patient and noted the horrible pool on the floor, he said softly, My God, what has happened to him? It was evident that the patient was sinking fast. He might die at any moment. I called to Quincy, The brandy, quick! We moistened the parched lips. For an instant, Renfield's eyes closed, not with pain or sleep, but voluntarily as though he were bringing all his faculties to bear. When he opened them, he said, I have something that I must say before I die. Van Helsing nodded slightly and said, Go on, in a low voice. Renfield proceeded. When Mrs. Harker came in to see me this afternoon, she wasn't the same. It was like tea after the teapot has been watered. Here we all moved, but no one said a word. He went on. I don't care for the pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them. And hers all seemed to have run out. I didn't think of it at the time, but when she went away I began to think. And it made me mad to know that he had been taking the life out of her. I could feel that the rest quivered, as did I, but we remained otherwise still. So when he came tonight, I was ready for him. He had to come out of the mist to struggle with me. I thought I was going to win, till I saw his eyes. They burned into me, 
and my strength became like water. He slipped through it, and when I tried to cling to him, he flung me down. There was a red cloud before me, and a noise like thunder, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. His voice was becoming fainter, and his breath more stertorous. Van Helsing stood up instinctively. We know the worst now, he said. He is here, and we know his purpose. There is not an instant to spare. We hurried and took from our rooms the same things that we had when we entered the Count's house. The professor had his ready, and as we met outside the Harker's door, he said, "Be wise, my friends. It is no common enemy that we deal with." He turned the handle as he spoke, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it. With a crash, it burst open. What I saw appalled me. I felt my hair rise like bristles on the back of my neck, and my heart seemed to stand still. The moonlight was so bright that through the thick yellow blind the room was light enough to see. On the bed beside the window lay Jonathan Harker, his face flushed and breathing heavily as though in a stupor. Kneeling on the near edge of the bed was the white-clad figure of his wife. By her side stood a tall, thin man clad in black. His face was turned from us, but the instant we saw, we all recognized the count. With his left hand, he held both Mrs. Harker's hands, keeping them away with her arms at full tension. His right hand gripped her by the back of the neck, forcing her face down onto his bosom. Her white nightdress was smeared with blood. And a thin stream trickled down the man's bare chest, which was shown by his torn open dress. As we burst into the room, the count turned his face, and the hellish look that I had heard described seemed to leap into it. His eyes flamed red with devilish passion, and the white, sharp teeth, behind the full lips of the blood dripping mouth, champed together like those of a wild beast. With a wrench which threw his victim back upon the bed as though hurled from a height, he turned and sprang at us. But by this time, the professor was holding towards him the envelope which contained the sacred wafer. The count suddenly stopped. Further and further back he cowered, as we, lifting our crucifixes, advanced. The moonlight suddenly failed. As a great black cloud sailed across the sky, and when the gaslight sprang up under Quincy's match, we saw nothing but a faint vapor. This, as we looked, trailed under the door. Van Helsing, Art, and I moved forward to Mrs. Harker. Her face was ghastly, with a pallor which was accentuated by the blood which smeared her lips and cheeks and chin. From her throat trickled a thin stream of blood. Her eyes were mad with terror. At the instant, I heard Harker's quick exclamation as he woke to partial consciousness. He seemed dazed for a few seconds, and then full consciousness seemed to burst upon him all at once. And with a quick movement, he jumped from the bed and began to pull on his clothes. In God's name, what does this mean? He cried. Doctor Van Helsing, do something to save her. Guard her while I look for him. Van Helsing and I tried to calm them both. The professor held up his crucifix and said, "Do not fear. Whilst this is close to you, no foul thing can approach." Then Van Helsing said, placing his hand tenderly on Mrs. Harker's head, "And now, Madam Mina, poor dear Madam Mina, tell us exactly what happened. God knows that I do not want that you be pained." But it is need that we know all. After a pause in which she was evidently ordering her thoughts, she began. I was awakened in the night, to find that there was in the room the same thin white mist that I had before noticed. I turned to wake Jonathan, but found that he slept so soundly I could not wake him. This caused me a great fear, and I looked around terrified. Then indeed my heart sank within me. Beside the bed, as if he had stepped out of the mist, 
stood a tall, thin man, all in black. I knew him at once. The waxen face, the parted red lips, with the sharp white teeth showing between, the red eyes. For an instant, my heart stood still, and I would have screamed out only that I was paralyzed. In the pause, he spoke in a sort of keen, cutting whisper, pointing as he spoke to Jonathan. Silence. If you make a sound, I shall dash his brains out before your very eyes. I was too bewildered to do or say anything. With a mocking smile, he placed one hand upon my shoulder, and holding me tight, bared my throat with the other, saying as he did so. First, a little refreshment to reward my exertions. And oh, my God, my God, pity me. He placed his reeking lips upon my throat. I felt my strength fading away, and I was in a half swoon. How long this lasted, I know not, but it seemed that a long time must have passed before he took his foul, awful, sneering mouth away. I saw it drip with the fresh blood. Then he spoke to me mockingly. And so you, like the others, would play your brains against mine. You would help these men to hunt me and frustrate me in my design. They should have kept their energies for use closer to home. Whilst they played wits against me, I was countermining them. And you, their best beloved one, are now my bountiful wine press for a while, and shall be later on my companion and my helper. And to that end, this. With that, he pulled open his shirt, and with his long, sharp nails opened a vein in his breast. When the blood began to spurt out, he took my hands in one of his, holding them tight, and with the other seized my neck and pressed my mouth to the wounds so that I must either suffocate or swallow some of the... Oh, my God. My God, what have I done? Then she began to rub her lips, as though to cleanse them from pollution. Harker was still and quiet, but over his face came a grey look which deepened and deepened in the morning light. Jonathan Harker, 3rd of October. It was agreed that before starting for Piccadilly, we should destroy the Count's lair close at hand. Van Helsing stood up and said, Madam Ina, before we go, let me see you armed against personal attack. On your forehead, I touch this piece of sacred wafer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and... There was a fearful scream which almost froze our hearts. As he had placed the wafer on Mina's forehead, it had seared it. It had burned into the flesh as though it had been a piece of white hot metal. The echo of the scream had not ceased to ring in the air when she sank on her knees on the floor in an agony of abasement. I must bear this mark of shame upon my forehead until the judgment day. Then Van Helsing said gravely, Madam Mina, so surely as we live, that scar shall pass away when God see right to lift the burden that is hard upon us. There was hope in his words, and comfort, and they made for resignation. Without a word we all knelt down together, and holding hands, swore to be true to each other. And we prayed for help and guidance in the terrible task which lay before us. Jonathan Harker We entered Carfax without trouble and found all things the same as on the first occasion. In the old chapel, the boxes looked just as we had seen them last. Dr. Van Helsing said to us as we stood before them, 
And now, my friends, we have a duty here to do. We must sterilize this earth, so sacred of holy memories that he is brought from a far distant land for such fell use. As he spoke, he took from his bag a screwdriver and a wrench, and very soon the top of one of the cases was thrown open. Taking a piece of the sacred wafer, he laid it reverently on the earth, and then shutting down the lid began to screw it home, we aiding him as he worked. One by one we treated in the same way each of the great boxes, and left them as we had found them to all appearance, but in each was a portion of the host. When we closed the door behind us, the professor said solemnly, So much is already done. It may be that with all the others we can be so successful. Then the sunset of this evening may shine of Madame Mina's forehead, all white as ivory and with no stain. As we passed across the lawn, on our way to the station to catch our train, we could see the front of the asylum. I looked, and in the window of my own room saw Mina. I waved to her. Piccadilly, 12.30 o'clock. My heart beat as I saw the house in which so much of our hope was centred, looming up grim and silent in its deserted condition. The door opened under a slight push, and we entered the hall. We moved to explore the house, all keeping together in case of attack, for we knew we had a strong and wily enemy to deal with. In the dining room, we found eight boxes of earth, eight only. We did not lose any time in examining the chests. We opened them, one by one, and treated them as we had treated those others in the old chapel. It was evident to us that the Count was not at present in the house, and we proceeded to search for his effects. There were title deeds of the Piccadilly House in a great bundle, deeds of the purchase of houses at Mile End and Bermondsey, and a heap of keys of all sorts and sizes, probably those belonging to the other houses. When we had examined this last find, Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris, taking notes of the addresses of the houses in the east and the south, took with them the keys in a great bunch and set out to destroy the boxes in these places. Dr. Seward, 3rd of October. The time seemed terribly long whilst we were waiting for the coming of Godalming and Quincy Morris. When they finally returned, they came quickly in and closed the door behind them, the former saying, It is all right. We found both places, six boxes in each, and we destroyed them all. October the 3rd. Before we parted, we discussed what our next step was to be, but we could arrive at no result. All we knew was that one earth box remained, and that the Count alone knew where it was. If he chooses to lie hidden, he may baffle us for years. And in the meantime, the thought is too horrible. I dare not think of it even now. October the 4th, morning. During the night I was awakened by Mina. She said to me hurriedly, Go call the professor. I want to see him at once. Two or three minutes later, Van Helsing was in the room, and Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming were with Dr. Seward at the door. When the professor saw Mina, he said, What am I to do for you? I want you to hypnotize me, she said. Do it before dawn, for I feel that then I can speak freely. Without a word, he motioned her to sit up in bed. Looking fixedly at her, he commenced to make passes from over the top of her head downward, with each hand in turn. Gradually her eyes closed, and she sat stock still. The stillness was broken by Van Helsing's voice, speaking in a low, level tone, which would not break the current of her thoughts. Where are you? The answer came in a neutral way. I do not know. It is all strange to me. What do you see? I can see nothing. It is all dark. What do you hear? The lapping of water. Then you are on a ship. We all looked at each other. 
trying to glean something each from the other. We were afraid to think. The answer came quick. Yes. What else do you hear? The sound of men stamping overhead. The creaking of a chain. What are you doing? I am still. Oh, so still. It is like death. The voice faded away in a deep breath, as of one sleeping, and the open eyes closed again. By this time the sun had risen, and we were all in the full light of day. Dr. Van Helsing placed his hands on Mina's shoulders and laid her head down softly on her pillow. Then the professor stood. God be thanked that we have once again a clue. We can know what it was in the Count's mind. He meant escape. Hear me? Escape! He saw that with but one earth box left and a pack of men following like dogs after a fox, this London was no place for him. He have take his last earth box and board a ship, and he leave the land. He think to escape, but no. We follow him. October the 15th, Varna. We left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, got to Paris that same night, and took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here at about five o'clock. Dr. Seward. 25th of October. Mrs. Harker has greatly changed during the past three weeks. Van Helsing examines her teeth very carefully while she is in the hypnotic condition, for he says that so long as they do not begin to sharpen, there is no active danger of a change in her. If this change should come, it would be necessary to take steps. We both know what those steps would have to be, though we do not mention our thoughts to each other. We should neither of us shrink from the task, awful though it be to contemplate. 27th of October. Most strange. No news yet of the ship we wait for. Mrs. Harker reported last night and this morning as usual, lapping waves and rushing water, though she added that the waves were very faint. Van Helsing is terribly anxious and told me just now that he fears the Count is escaping us. Mina Harker, 30th of October, evening. They were all so tired and worn out and dispirited that there was nothing to be done till they'd had some rest. Oh, if I could only help. I shall do what I can. I do believe that under God's providence I've made a discovery. My new conclusion is ready, so I shall get our party together and read it. Mina Harker's Memorandum My surmise is this, that in London the Count decided to get back to his castle by water as the most safe and secret way. I have examined the map and find that the river most suitable is either the Pruth or the Sereth. Now, of these two, the Pruth is the more easily navigated, but the Sereth is, at Fundu, joined by the Bistritza, which runs up round the Borgo Pass. The loop it makes is manifestly as close to Dracula's castle as can be got by water. When I had done reading, Dr. Van Helsing said, Our dear Madam Mina is once more our teacher. Now we are on the track once again, and this time we may succeed. Our enemy is at his most helpless, and if we can come on him by day, on the water, our task will be over. Now, to our council of war, for here and now we must plan what each and all shall do. I shall get a steam launch and follow him, said Lord Godalming, and I horses to follow on the bank, lest by chance he land, said Mr. Morris. Dr. Seward said, I think I'd better go with Quincy. We've been accustomed to hunt together, and we two, well armed, will be a match for whatever may come along. Jonathan looked at me. I could see that the poor dear was torn about in his mind. He was silent a while, and during his silence, 
Dr. Van Helsing spoke. Friend Jonathan, you are young and brave and can fight, and all energies may be needed at the last. And it is your right to destroy him, that which has wrought such woe to you and yours. Be not afraid for Madame Mina. She will be my care, if I may. While you, my Lord Godalming, and friend Jonathan, go in your so swift steamboat up the river, and whilst John and Quincy guard the bank where perchance he might be landed, we shall go in the track where Jonathan went, from Bistritz over the Borgo, and find our way to the castle of Dracula. There is much to be done, and other places to be made sanctify, so that that nest of vipers be obliterated. 1st of November, night. The Bistritza River. I'm writing this in the light from the furnace door of the steam launch. Lord Godalming is firing up. He tells me to sleep for a while. But how can I with the terrible danger hanging over my darling and her going out into that awful place? It is a wild adventure we are on, into a whole world of dark and dreadful things. 1st of November. All day long we have travelled, and at a good speed. The professor seems tireless. All day he would not take any rest, though he made me sleep for a long spell. At sunset time he hypnotised me, and he says I answered as usual, darkness, lapping water, and creaking wood. So our enemy is still on the river. 2nd of November, night. All day long, driving. Dr. Van Helsing says that by morning we shall reach the Borgo Pass. Oh, what will tomorrow bring to us? We go to seek the place where my poor darling suffered so much. Memorandum by Abraham Van Helsing. 5th of November. All yesterday we travel, getting ever closer to the mountains and moving into our more and more wild and desert land. Mother Mina sleep and sleep, for though I had hunger and appeased it, I could not waken her even for food. I began to fear that the fatal spell of the place was upon her, tainted as she is with that vampire baptism. By evening time we reached a steep, rising hill, on summit of which was such a castle as Jonathan tell of in his diary. I exulted and feared, for now, for good or ill, the end was near. Dr. Van Helsing's Memorandum Ere the great dark came upon us, I took out the horses and fed them in what shelter I could. Then I make a fire, and near it I make Madame Mina sit comfortable amid her rocks. I got ready food, but she would not eat, saying that she had not hunger. Then, with the fear on me of what might be, I drew a ring around where Madame Mina sat, and over the ring I passed some of the wafer, and I broke it fine, so that all was well guarded. I said to her presently, Will you not come over to the fire, for I wish to make a test of what she could? She rose obedient, but when she had made a step she stopped and stood as one stricken. Why not go on? I asked. She said simply, I cannot, and remained silent. I rejoiced, for I knew that what she could not, none of those that we dreaded could. Presently, the horses began to scream and tore at their tethers till I came to them and quieted them. The fire began to die and I was about stepping forth to replenish it, for now the snow came in flying sweeps, and with it a chill mist, and it seemed as though the snow flurries and the wreaths of mist took shape, 
as of women with trailing garments. I began to fear horrible fears. It was as though my memories of all Jonathan's horrid experience were befooling me. I feared for my dear Madame Mina when those weird figures drew near and circled round. I looked at her, but she sat calm and smiled at me. When I would have stepped to the fire to replenish it, she caught me and held me back and whispered, like a voice that one hears in a dream so low it was, No, do not go without. Here you are safe. I turned to her, and looking in her eyes said that I fear. Whereat she laughed, a laugh low and unreal, and said, Fear for me? Why fear for me? None safer in all the world from them than I am. The wheeling figures of mist and snow came closer, but keeping ever without the holy circle. Then they began to materialize, till they were before me in actual flesh, the same three women that Jonathan saw in the room when they would have kissed his throat. They smiled ever at poor dear Madame Mina. They pointed to her and said, Come, sister, come to us. And my heart with gladness leapt like flame, for all oh, the terror in her sweet eyes, the repulsion, the horror, told a story to my heart that was all of hope. God be thanked she was not yet of them. I seized some of the firewood which was by me, and holding out some of the wafer, advanced on them. They drew back before me, and laughed a low, hearted laugh. I feared them not, for I knew that we were safe within the ring, which she could not leave, no more than they could enter. And so we remained till the red of the dawn began to fall through the snow gloom. At the first coming of the dawn, the hurried figures melted in the whirling mist and snow. 5th November afternoon When I left Madame Mina sleeping within the holy circle, I took my way to the castle. Jonathan's bitter experience served me here. There were at least three graves to find, so I search and search, and I find one of them. She lay in her vampire sleep, so full of life and voluptuous beauty, that I shudder as though I have come to do murder. Then I braced myself to my hurried task, and found by wrenching away tomb tops one other of the sisters, the other dark one. I go on searching until, presently, I find in a high great tomb, as if made to one much beloved, that other fair sister. There was one great tomb more lordly than all the rest. Huge it was, and nobly proportioned. On it was but one word, Dracula. This, then, was the undead home of the King Vampire, to whom so many more were due. Before I began to restore these women to their dead selves through my awful work, I laid in Dracula's tomb some of the wafer, and so banished him from it, undead forever. Then began my terrible task. Oh, but it was butcher's work. Had I not been nerved by thoughts of other dead and of the living over whom hung such a pall of fear, I could not have gone on. I could not have endured the horrid screeching as the stake drove home, the plunging of writhing form, the lips of bloody foam. But it is over. And the poor souls, I can pity them now and weep, as I think of them placid, each in her full sleep of death, for a short time, 
air fading, for hardly had my knife severed the head of each before the whole body began to melt away and crumble into its native dust. Before I left the castle, I so fixed its entrances that never more can the Count enter there undead. When I stepped into the circle where Madame Mina slept, she woke, and seeing me, cried out, Come away from this awful place. Let us go to meet my husband, who is, I know, coming towards us. She was looking thin and pale and weak. But her eyes were pure and glowed with fervor. Mina Harker, 6th of November. It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. There was something wild and uncanny about the place. We could hear the distant howling of wolves. I knew from the way Dr. Van Helsing was searching about that he was trying to seek some strategic point. He'd found a sort of natural hollow in a rock, with an entrance like a doorway between two boulders. He brought in our furs and made a snug nest for me. Taking his field glasses from the case, he stood on the top of the rock and began to search the horizon. Suddenly he called out, Look, Madame Mina, look! Straight in front of us, and not far off, came a group of mounted men hurrying along. In the midst of them was a cart which swept from side to side with each stern inequality of the road. Outlined against the snow as they were, I could see from the men's clothes that they were peasants or gypsies of some kind. On the cart was a great chest. My heart leapt as I saw it, for I felt that the end was coming. The evening was now drawing close, and well I knew that at sunset the thing which was till then imprisoned there would take new freedom and could in any of many forms elude all pursuit. In fear I turned to the professor. They come quickly, he said. They are racing for the sunset. We may be too late. God's will be done. Then came a sudden cry. Look, two horsemen follow fast, coming up from the south. It must be Quincy and John. Take the glass. I took it and, looking around, saw on the north side of the coming party two other men riding at breakneck speed. One of them I knew was Jonathan, and the other I took to be Lord Godalming. They too were pursuing the party with the cart. The professor and I crouched down behind our rock and held our weapons ready. I could see that he was determined that they should not pass. One and all were quite unaware of our presence. Then, all at once, two voices shouted out to halt. They lashed the horses, which sprang forward, but the four men raised their Winchester rifles and, in an unmistakable way, commanded them to stop. At the same moment, Dr. Van Helsing and I rose behind the rock and pointed our weapons at them. Seeing that they were surrounded, the men tightened their reins and drew up. All four men of our party threw themselves from their horses and dashed towards the cart. Seeing the quick movement of our parties, the leader of the gypsies gave a command. His men instantly formed round the cart in a sort of undisciplined endeavour. In the midst of this, I could see that Jonathan on one side of the ring of men and Quincy on the other were forcing a way to the cart. Jonathan's impetuosity seemed to overawe those in front of him. Instinctively, they cowered aside and let him pass. In an instant, he jumped upon the cart and, with a strength which seemed incredible, raised the great box and flung it over the wheel to the ground. In the meantime, Mr. Morris had had to use force to pass through his side of the ring. He'd parried with his great bowie knife, and at first I thought that he too had come through in safety. But as he sprang beside Jonathan, who had by now jumped from the cart, I could see that with his left hand he was clutching at his side and that blood was spurting through his fingers. He did not delay, notwithstanding this, for as Jonathan attacked one end of the chest, attempting to prise off the lid, he attacked the other frantically with his bowie. Under the efforts of both men, the lid began to yield. The nails drew, and the top of the box was thrown back. I saw the Count lying within the box upon the earth. He was deathly pale, like a waxen image, 
and the red eyes glared with the horrible, vindictive look which I knew too well. As I looked, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it shear through the throat, whilst at the same moment Mr. Morris's Bowie knife plunged into the heart. It was like a miracle, but before our very eyes, and almost in the drawing of a breath, the whole body crumbled into dust, and passed from our sight. The gipsies turned and rode away as if for their lives. Mr. Morris, who had sunk to the ground, leaned on his elbow. Holding his hand pressed to his side, the blood still gushed through his fingers. I flew to him. Jonathan knelt, and the wounded man laid back his head on his shoulder. Oh God! He cried suddenly, pointing to me. Look. With one impulse, the men sank on their knees, and a deep and earnest Amen broke from all as their eyes followed the pointing of his finger. As the dying man spoke, God be thanked that all has not been in vain. See, the snow is not more stainless than her forehead. The curse has passed away. Dracula by Bram Stoker and abridged by Dara Carvel was read by Michael Fassbender, Gillian Kearney, James Darcy, and James Green. The producer was Gemma McMullen.